Welcome to This Week in Action from Crushing Comics. We're here to discuss X-Men number two. And in this one, the team celebrate a time-honored tradition of the team, which is squashing space bugs. Stay tuned for our discussion of X-Men number two. All right, we've arrived at the second issue of this new Jerry Duggan, Pepe Larraz, Marta Gracia, X-Men series number two. It definitely continues from number one, but it doesn't immediately follow number one. It's kind of just one of the many balls in the air of these new foes of the X-Men. And so, of course, to discuss it, we're going to spoil number one. We're going to spoil other X-Men comic books. We might talk about some other things that have happened in the Marvel Universe. So you have our standard spoiler warning there. Before we could get into any of the details, of course, we've got to give our initial reactions. For X-Men number two, let's start with Tyler. What did you think about this second issue? I'm not going to be, well, I hope I'm not going to be a Debbie Downer, but um, wah, wah, I mean, I had, I had several complaints about this book. And um, the, the, the major issue for me here is the voice of some of the characters. I mean, we, we can go into details of that later. And also, I think the art looks off this issue. The lines are a little bit too thick and the colors are a little bit too dark. And that combination just made everything looks a bit muddy. I'm going to give it a 2.5 barbecue ribs out of five. Oh, God, don't, I'm hungry. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I have to say before we move on, Tyler, you are not the only person online that I've seen use that phrase muddy about this issue. I almost mm-hmm. wonder if maybe it was like a digital conversion. Did you read it physically or digitally? No, digitally. Yeah, I, My I haven't heard from any of you read it physically yet. because I've heard that a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, on to Harry. Harry, yeah. what uh, were your yeah. first <laughs> impressions? My uncultured eyes enjoyed the art quite a bit. Um, you know, I really, I, I do think this might be my favorite depiction of the uh, Annihilation Wave, like flat out. Just like, I think that's a properly gross, grody kind of depiction. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this is not a deep comic. I don't know if it's trying to be. I hope it's not. But like, I think it hits its beats relatively well i enjoyed the art um i did think a couple of the character voices were off i did ping that but um overall like i mean this thing set out to be like kind of a meat and potatoes superhero book and in that i think it's fairly successful you might not know you might notice this is not the highest of praise i've ever given a book <laughs> but um it's still it's still it's art i enjoy and uh so i'm gonna give it a three and a half uh bug waves out of five I I think I shared a lot of your, both of your detractions for it. It just felt small to me. I know it was supposed to mm-hmm. feel big, but it's kind of like the X-Men have fought bug things before. Because the Annihilation Wave is not an X-Men concept, and it's been a while since I've read those comics, it, it doesn't hit for me the way the Brood would hit. Not that I'm saying it should have been the Brood, but it almost yeah. kind of feels like it's really relying on you to know your your past decade of Marvel history in order to like get how big of a deal it is. And even for me, as somebody who knew it, I was kind of like, eh. also, I just, I really just didn't like the art. Like I can't pretend. I think we've, we've praised Lars enough on this channel mm-hmm. that it doesn't sound like I'm like coming for him, but, but I just think all the characters were kind of off. But the thing I did like is I didn't mind the voices so much. There were a couple of times like Harry, where I was pinged by like, that's not how this person usually yeah. sounds. But if you're going to actually have a, a purpose for that character and push them in a direction and give them consistency, I don't mind so much if you've turned 20 degrees away from their normal sure. voice or even like yeah. 45 degrees away from their normal voice. But it, but if you're going to have a vector and it's going to keep moving and you're going to go in that direction. So like, I, I definitely feel like Polaris is a little bit off. I don't know Mm -hmm. that it's necessarily the gene in Cyclops that I always know. But at the same time, I think that Duggan's probably doing the best gene we've got right now. So like, let's go 45 degrees, (laughs) maybe even closer to 90 degrees away from the other way. I don't care. Let's just go somewhere. So that that's my initial reaction. It just it didn't really hit for me. But there were things about it that were pleasant. I mean, that was the same issue for me with um, Duggan's Marauders in the beginning, Mm -hmm. because I felt that um, Kate's voice was a little bit off. Um, especially in issue one. I remember then, you saying that when we yeah. first got together to start catching up on stuff. Correct. And then I think gradually it sort of evolved into something that kind of makes sense. And so, I mean, I'm giving him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here so that, um, um, you know, maybe I will catch up on where he's bringing these characters. But, um, but I mean, 
Polaris is the one is 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 the main one that yeah I, that, that I have it didn't feel like with. any Polaris that I've met mm, ever before. It's too it's too princessy. It's like uh, oh this is girl. It's I'm gonna close my eyes. I'm gonna close my eyes. She was in the Rise space. and Fall yeah. of Star yeah. Empire. She, she, was she was in, in space. space of anyone. She was on. She'd be like, yeah. I've seen this kind of stuff. For me, it was a uh, Wolverine, and like I I haven't read like as much of all new Wolverine as others, but like I do feel like that character's got like a bit more warmth to her voice and like mm-hmm. i feel like like writers sometimes just kind of paint her as like gruff wolverine wannabe almost like 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 a just like a that basic template and kind of leave it there and mm-hmm. this is kind of she didn't have a ton of dialogue but this is kind of where that felt to me um so i guess we all have some issues <laughs> <laughs> and also it doesn't help at all that the problems that laura seems to be having is with the female cast members he's Mm. drawing them he hasn't really found the difference in their likenesses he's having a lot of trouble with face shapes and uh and the proportions he seems to really have trouble drawing wolverine's costume i've noticed and Mm. in the past two issues in the cover it's always like a little distended he doesn't quite know where to put her chest the arms feel like they're coming out at a weird angle and it's like lara's clearly knows anatomy i think there's something Mm -hmm. about the lines of the costume that must be like vexing him how to proportion them in relation to her body. Cause I don't know that there's been one panel of her that has not looked weird so far, both in two issues and in the covers and things that I've seen. So that's not helping. Like if he doesn't have a likeness yeah. for her or Rogue or Polaris and he's only really got a gene likeness, like no wonder their voices feel so weird. They feel like off model and they don't really sound like themselves. But I wanna, mm-hmm. I wanna talk about this voice thing one time. Cause I think this is interesting. I wanna get Harry's opinion. Uh, yeah. You know, we're longtime X-Men readers. We value consistency. But is there something to be said for a series that maybe shifts a character a little bit, like maybe Doug and Ditto and Marauders, but has a consistent fixed idea in its head that's like, in this period, this character is going to be this, this is my version of that character. Like, is that forgivable, even if it's a right turn from where the character usually is? And I mean, for you, I don't mean like, generally speaking, do you forgive that? Oh uh, yeah, I mean that's that's I'm very easy to forgive that actually because I'm I'm a pretty big believer in like let this writer give this character a voice that's right. most comfortable to them. Now, I mean there are if you push it too hard, but I almost feel like the bigger issue can be if you it's off the typical voice, but it's still kind of bland or yeah. like not really distinct enough. And I think that's the issue this book has, because I'll be honest, like I don't fully know Polaris enough to get that voice and see the differences. But like when I'm reading this character, like I still don't really understand. I'm not like something about it isn't like making an impression on me. And I, I do feel like that's almost a bigger issue where I'm just like, I still don't know who you are. And we're like two ish, like voice. What does that make sense? I, something about it. Mm-hmm. It's I'm, I'm fine with like, writers giving characters different voices or taking them on their own track like i am like a pretty fair bendis apologist for that although he's got a whole other trunk of problems but like um yeah so it's if if they're going to do something interesting or distinct like i'm fine with mixing it up i just don't think that's what duggan's doing here because he he's got a very he can lean into vanilla superhero voices. Yes. I think that's definitely think a thing so. he can do. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing with Polaris because I think Polaris is regressive in the sense. Okay. Like she has regressed into a teenage girl, which is the yeah, which is the mode that I really dislike for some of these characters because mm-hmm. they've been around for a long time, you know. Which is you know again my pet peeve for not Dugans but for Revenders, Uncanny Avengers is mm-hmm. Rogue's voice. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. because she they, they regress her. But and anyway. I, yeah, I I just on I was said I didn't even like read that much rug by the time I got to Uncanny Avengers was like she is mad like all the time in this book, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. It was weird. Well, <laughs> well, you both bring up interesting points because, you know, I think one of the pervasive conversations we've had in the channel ch- of channel is Tyler's struggle with Benjamin Percy's version of Wolverine and how like mean and petty he is. And this yeah. is an example of like to to what end? Like, if you're going to make mm-hmm. that big of a change from that established of a character, what are you driving to with that character? And at least with Remender's Uncanny Avengers, which I am not apologizing for, mm-hmm. at least we can see, okay, well, he needed Rogue to kind of be the internal antagonist on that team. Yeah. It couldn't be friendly Southern Bell Rogue. It had to be a regressed folk Rogue. Now, mm-hmm. is that satisfying to us as somebody who's been reading Rogue for, it's her 40 year anniversary this week, actually? No, mm-hmm. it, it is not mm-hmm. satisfying. But at least there's like an internal reason. And I think with Polaris, you know, we've had her almost be in this kind of like wishy-washy way this back foot way this kind of very borderline personality sort of way Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like it feels like other writers have found better uses for her 
But then on this team, it's like, well, you can't just have her be kind of the stone cold one because you've got Lara. You can't just have her be the warm and friendly expert because you've got Rogue. She can't be the leader because you have Jean. So it's like, where are you going to slot her in? I feel like the way to do it is to make her more impetuous, but unsure about it. Like almost Mm -hmm. coming on really strong and then like backing off a little because she's trying to find the balance of like is she Magneto's daughter is she a, a an X-Men that everybody voted for but then you have Sunfire who I think represents that really well as well so it kind of just this is part of why I didn't want to vote for Polaris to begin with That's, I just don't yeah. I love Polaris she's one of my favorite characters but like I just don't think she has a distinct space on this team and as a result we're getting this wishy-washy voice yeah and maybe like this is like a, I don't want to like you know talk trash about D- Duggan too much, like saying like he's unable to like change courses, but it does feel very gimmicky when you just like slot a character in like by by random choice through voting. And like, I feel like this is a kind of a kind of an obvious result, which is like, he did not track or plan this book to have this voice in the beginning. And it kind of feels a little awkward. But maybe it'll um, catch or up, not, maybe in yeah, three or maybe. more issues. But sure. I think the thing I thought you were gonna say, and then we'll move on to more, is um, Duggan, this is a Duggan thing, right? Tyler, mm-hmm. like, he he went on to Deadpool and he made a very uniquely voiced Deadpool. He went mm-hmm. on to Uncanny Avengers with a bunch of Avengers who had relatively inconsistent voices and kind of gave them a version of a personality. Like, yep. that's just kind of what Duggan does at Marvel. He's not, he, he respects a lot of continuity. Even on Savage Avengers, he's writing a very idiosyncratic version of Conan. And it's mm-hmm. kind of like, he respects a lot of his he's really good at continuity but he's not here to just like feed you the version of the character you've had already and sometimes that kind of grates against your brain a little bit more than other i don't know would you agree with that no i mean that definitely agree with that and um and 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 that's why sometimes it is really successful like his his deadpool and uh one of our favorites cable yeah um, right because who he could transgress as evil as much as he wanted to transgress on yeah yeah. well and and he gave Scott and Jean a pretty unique voice in that book, which we have not seen elsewhere as the parent. And we do see a little bit of it here, actually. Okay. That's the perfect next point, because I decided as I was reading this in my ups and downs with it, that I officially am allowing Duggan to adopt Scott and Jean. I, I think he should have custody from them from Hickman for a long time. There's there's not a lot of people I like who write the two of them. And I, I like the dynamic that Duggan has created for them because it's not Scott, Jean, Scott, Jean. Like they still do it occasionally, but it just feels like there's like a little bit more texture and and the the depth of people who've known each other and trusted each other, and it kind of, it just feels more mature the way you voice it, and I and I dig it, and it lets you have great moments like this first, the actual first note I have to talk about here after all this buildup, <laughs> which is Sync and Gene and Gene coaching Sync on how to use psychic powers. This was good X Men, y'all. Yeah, yeah. like I, yeah, this is what I'm here to read. It's the best part of the issue. Yeah. yeah, Harry, why is it the best part of the issue for you? Well, it's kind of like it's it's. It's taking this character whose power is, you know, sort of in step with Jean's in this context. And it's kind of like looking at it from an interesting angle. And you have Jean sort of looking at her powers and explaining like how they can be more in sync. Just like in in this interesting, like warm way, it comes off very much like this elder statesman kind of like pointing out what to do. And like just, you know, the the moment that I'm sure we're all going to talk about is just her saying, you know, like, it's nice that you can turn it off. And it doesn't even seem like, like this is a bird. It, I mean, it is a bird. It's not like she's like dying here. It's just like, I'm happy for you. And it's there's like- It's very Superman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very warm. It hits the right level. It's very just, and I think you just nailed it. Like the, there's like a comfort with these two characters that how Duggan writes them. That's yeah. like, we, you know, Hickman, like he wrote the broad strokes, but like you feel it with, with uh, Duggan. Well, Tyler. you said Superman, and we had yeah. a cancer scene with an alien ball dropping into the face. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, Superman. Oh, uh, it was the most Superman-ass thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I was just like, all right, I'm not mad. Like, yeah. put it in. <laughs> no, um, specifically on uh, Everett and um, um, Everett and, um, mm-hmm. and, and Jean, um, I like the fact that, you know, um, Dugan casually dropped the fact that uh, Sink went to Emma first. Because mm. Emma was his first mutant yeah. teacher. Mm. Besides and because Banshee. so much of that generation has been erased from our memory or <laughs> yeah. killed, we don't get a lot of people who like go to Emma for like uh, like coaching. Coaching. But Sink has been dead all this time. So like, of course he would go to Emma. Emma is still exactly. his, his m- mature parent type coach figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And so, so I, I like that little nugget that just dropped in and it makes sense. And you don't really need to have that history to, to, to like that. But, yeah. you know, but I thought it was really fun. Yeah. But how far away are they like, you know, thinking of like powers because Kansas is pretty far away from oh, yeah. Manhattan. Fast well, they take the, the blackboard. Oh, you mean, well, yeah, right. Like, how Sense. many people died that they're yeah, like, I, well, I felt a great disturbance in the force. Like, <laughs> yeah, is that like, 10 people, whoa. 100 people? What order of magnitude pings Gene's radar from Kansas? Right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like what, a thousand miles away or more? More than a thousand. Like, that one. Yeah. We're not sure so, the experts here. <laughs> uh, I was like, but here's to close out the segment. Mm-hmm. Sink muses that he could share his memories from the vault with Laura if she was interested and he had her consent, Mm. but not now. And I was like, oh, like this is, a lot of these characters, I don't think have a lot of hooks for each other because they are kind of such a random assemblage. And so for some Mm -hmm. of them, Duggan's got to build it in as he does with with Sunfire here. But like that was a good beat. Because it lets us, it reminds us that there's this unresolved tension there, and it's mm-hmm. not just going to be played out as this like boy who's pining. Like he gets that there's ethical concerns, and they're different, literally different people now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my read was also, but not not saying he was pining, but this was very much classic comics of just like I've got issues, we got to work them out. Like she doesn't know how I feel, so I guess it was pining to me. But it was like <laughs> it felt like classic comics in a good way. But I do trust Duggan not to like you know, sit around with it and kind of have it be like more, more um, proper, you know, as, as y'all just said. Yeah. But I mean, even surrounding sync, there is this duality to him, right? Because mm-hmm. he is still trying to learn how to gel with like the, 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 with the powers of the rest of the team, but he's also the most experienced one. And both mm-hmm. Gene and Scott acknowledge that, that, you know, that he has, Yes, like thousands of years of yeah. experience, you know, over them. So, so I thought that was a pretty interesting um, dynamics to play into the whole thing. Like he's he's not the the new guy here. No, yeah, he's a veteran. <laughs> yeah. And that's I think what I mean about playing the pining. I think that it would be easy to just reduce that whole experience to like him making sad moon eyes at Lara all no. the time. But actually, Duggan has found I think more complexity in it, which is like how do you play this person who's the newest one back on the street with with mutants, but the oldest one too, which feels just like a hair different from what he was doing with our beloved table, which is like here's this person with all this future knowledge, but he's also a stranger to them and they don't trust him. And it's like maybe Duggan is just really good at writing this particular plot beat uh, because I, I'm here for it yet again. So they get into the extra. We're, by the way, not going to talk about Rogue school marming the poker game. Like, I, no. have, I have no time for that. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. okay. Uh, I don't like that. Yeah. So uh, so they go to Kansas and there's an Annihilation Wave bomb. Now, Harry sounds like he's a little fresher on the Annihilation <laughs> Wave than I am. So Harry... Well, is this cool? Like, what, what what did this do for you as a concept? I, okay, I don't know how fresh I want to come about this, but like, I think it was interesting. I think it's I I no, I do like that Duggan makes the choice that we are going to take an entire event and kind of an omnibus worth of stories, and we are going to establish it and knock it off the table in one issue because of the X Men, and like that almost makes it seem smaller. I get that argument i I understand that but i do think it's a ballsy move to just be like we are so far past the annihilation wave that like our one team of x-men are strong enough to do this i i did dig that i also think i i just love like you know the annihilation wave in that original series is just like a I, i mean it's been a while but like a lot of like bugs a lot of like warrior looking bugs and this is like some kind of like growing mass from hell of just these tendrils and claws and pincers and just gross stuff and like that that's a cool thing to see from Loraz. so i was just into the design a lot Hmm. i think before i hand it over to tyler i have to say maybe this is your influence on me harry but i liked the idea that he took this whole omnibus event story and kind of He's like, and we're going to make a bullet out of it and we're firing it at Earth, right? I'm like, yeah, I love bullets it. Through, bullets right. through space, man. Yeah, and, and, well, and also this idea of like any kind of like condensed 
story storytelling as a weapon like we're gonna mm-hmm. use this whole story and everything it represents as a weapon and like yeah there's gonna be people who are gonna be like man they the knowledge wave cop to the x-men too easy man they've got so many more feats now than the cosmic heroes but that's not the yeah. point it's about like weaponizing somebody else's plot to use against a different franchise which mm-hmm. maybe i'm giving him too much credit but i thought that was really clever yeah i think it's like efficient also economical yeah. in a way mm-hmm. all right tyler <laughs> I just, I mean, you guys have covered most of it, but but I like the fact that like uh, um, Steve Rogers basically drills the team, his team, for past knowledge of extinction events, yeah. and, and, and 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 it got me thinking. It's like, what if they do not know? What is the punishment? Is it like Steve's <laughs> severe Burby's disappointment? Like, you know, the... <laughs> Failed. Like, yeah. Oh, you you disappointed me now. <laughs> that that is the worst, worst punishment. On Jarvis off. <laughs> God. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, again, I don't know that Duggan knows what to do with Rogue yet either. No. He, his And the thing was, his Rogue was good on yeah. Uncanny Avengers. So Avengers. I, he has some benefit of the doubt with Rogue yeah. for me, but only a little bit. All right, Tyler, here, here it is. It's your time to shine. Orcus <laughs> Which... has Scott's body from mm. House of X number four. Yep. Clearly, Scott is around. And so they're starting to have some thoughts and they carbon dated it. And they mm-hmm. and that seemed like an appropriately aged Scott. And this seems like an appropriately aged Scott. So what is going on? I give you the floor. I mean, that's the thing. This is the part which I thought, um, the, this last section is really interesting to me because now it ties in into the greater scheme of things. Now it ties in into Arcus, which ties in into Sword, which yeah. ties in into Way of X. I mean, there's so many things here, um, which is really interesting. And then, of course, he latched on to what he see that in issue one, which is that people discovering the you know resurrection protocol. And um, I mean, this is the this is the the plot that I'm watching. This is the yeah. one thing that keeps me coming back for more X Men. Um, I mean. You know the, the 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 big robot is fine. The the insect fight is fine. You know the the the, the fact that um, the humans and, and mutants are now working together is is great. Um, you know they are no longer. You know we are, we are sort of like saying no longer are we talking about um, humans hating mutants because they are going to take over um, us. That kind of thing here. Um, even though Orcus is kind of doing that, but they are a little bit more sinister. They are a little bit more organized, and it feels bigger for me. Yeah, like so much more than you know some some of this. Oh, we hate mutants because they are mm-hmm. you know whatever whatever you know. So, so I thought it was really interesting, and then and then here we are of course getting a little bit more details of like oh okay, there's this pedal, there's the fourth pedal, there's the fifth pedal, which we saw uh, in the Way chart uh, in yeah. in Way of X. Way of X and 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 I think way back in Hox One, I think so. when it was yeah. introduced, yeah. So it was. I mean, I think it's interesting. Harry, I really like the pacing of this because I I know what you're saying, Tower, but like for me, just I because I've enjoyed just the meat and potatoes of this because I think it's done like just a little bit better than others. Mm-hmm. The point is, I like that this is being built very patiently and measuredly where it's just yeah. like last issue is them realizing what's going on or he's having an idea next issue is getting some evidence and they keep mm-hmm. slowly building on this i think that's a cool way to do it now it better like land it better deliver like it's yeah. clearly they're on the right track here so but like i like the idea of just like you have this fun stuff happening then you have this this bomb the, the biggest thing really in these books is mm-hmm. slowly getting built to and i think it's executed in a really fun way i think this is just like a really great data page or this like uh this re- reports and like i love the fact that they kind of carbon dated the remains and all that mm-hmm. like that was clever and it felt like them doing like almost like putting in the shoe leather and the work to like really earn this reveal and i i think that's really fun mm-hmm. yeah i think it's interesting you know there's people online still beating the drum of like, well, this is a very different direction than Hickman. This is a very different book than Hickman. And it's like, well, A, no, it's not. Because yeah. these, all of these themes were have been the themes all along. Yeah. But B, I think that 
it's fine that this is version 2.0. Like they, as a team of writers and editors, seem to have learned something from Hickman's run, which is that you can do these episodic stories and fans will like it, but maybe what it was missing was some consistency in cast and some consistency in certain story beats to kind of like make it feel linked. And like maybe that's what was so wearying about that X-Men run is that sometimes you'd read two issues, three issues, four issues in a row, and there was no thematic link between any of the yeah. four issues, no cast member, those, no plot. And it started to feel like you couldn't even tell where you were. So here's D Duggan, really, so far, I mean, two very different issues, very different challenges. They're not a continuation of one another, but they have the same cast. And there's these little hints of things that are developing that are being dropped into the issues. And I think it's effective. Do I love this title? No. But mm. do I think it's actually an effective way to do flagship X-Men? Yeah, actually, I, I really do think it's an effective way to do flagship X-Men. As, maybe as effective as you could be, um, knowing that there are limits to what you can do with a flagship title and still make it seem flagship -y. So any guesses to the identity of Dr. Stasis? Is that not Goggle Guy? Is I thought it was some big. I thought it was Goggle Guy. Devo. Well, it is. No, that's Devo. I'm bad at names and faces. The Goggle Guys is Devo, but um, we had somebody else from some other. No, we had a Goggle Guys at the end of the last of last issue. I thought it was just the guy from last issue, and yeah, it is. But but there's this helmet. Um, there's this helmet that's strong. What was that? I don't know. I don't recognize that. And then like who is that a create thing? Is it? It, it almost looks like a Cree helmet. I could totally be off base there. Yeah, probably no, it kind of looks like that. The um, design <laughs> like Marvel Captain Star. Marvel goes bad because she's working exactly. with a box. That's, that's what I was saying. killed the Inhumans. It okay. really looks yeah. like that. And then the other the other thing is that who creates like, you know, uh, um, anima, animal um, uh, creatures like humans? Like, because there's a tiger um, that appears, right? The, the solicits. Sitting. I don't want to... I, I read the solicits and actually I was about oh. to, I, should I say, I mean. Well, I mean, it feel, as somebody who doesn't read the solicits, it feels yeah. very high evolutionary to me because that's what high evolutionary does. It would. That's that, what is what that, is, that is what he does. That's all. I'll say. Yeah. That, that was what, what I'm thinking. Yeah. So, okay. but then, but then why hide his face? Because, because we all know him and he appears last issue. I don't think it, it, it can't be high evolutionary because he was. He was just in space and we're dealing yeah. with all that space stuff here. It would be weird to have him already set up as Dr. Stasis under exactly. a name in this. But here's the other thing for all of the beating up I did on Loraz on maybe not quite having the likenesses and the looks. These mm -hmm. couple of pages at the end yeah. are stunning. Mm -hmm. And Marta yeah. Gracia, I can complain sometimes about the way that he uses light. It feels over the top. But here, just the way the sun hits everything, the beams of light, the, the um, kind of cross beams as they glint across the eye of this cat person this was good this was mm -hmm. this was really really good and it makes me yeah. be like okay laraz is still a master he's just having some trouble <laughs> with this stupid wolverine costume i also <laughs> laughed real quick about um the kansas barbecue guy who's very clearly jerry duggan i was which like, oh there he is <laughs> twitter easter egg he did not know laraz was going to draw it as him and so he was surprised that. to see that yeah. he was there I wearing a Deadpool shirt. yeah <laughs> Uh, but also, I guess that's the final thing we can talk about, and I'll and I'll hand it off to Tyler for this talk. We get Duggan did promise that we were he didn't reveal all of the why people got voted for mm -hmm. during the actual gala because it was going to be part of this book, and we get our first montage of that, which is Sunfire, who can be a pretty oblique character sometimes, yeah. kind of explaining why he cared to be on the X-Men. I read it a few times and I don't know that I understand yet, but I'm going to turn it over to Tyler to, to take on this final topic. Um, I'm going to be honest. I don't like it. Um, and <laughs> Okay. I mean, there, there are two things that I don't like. The first thing is I don't like where it is placed in this issue because it okay, felt yeah. too horny. I agree. Um, because um, I, I think, I don't think Sunfire is going to come out to the humans and say that, oh, you know, uh, I'm doing this, 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 and that's why they, that's why I want to be an X-Man. And, you know, I mean, the reasoning could be there, um, but the vague reasoning of Sunfire just wants to serve is, doesn't sit well with me. Um, because, oh. I mean, why? Why would he want? Why? Why? Why would he just want to serve? Because like, Krakoa is so great. It's so great. I mean, I get it. I agree. It's an you know what I mean. Like it, yeah. it, it doesn't hit the right notes for me. It doesn't. 
um so 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 you know that's why it's like mm, yeah i don't know i mean i rather i rather it be something like um he's thinking like well i'm I can join the X-Men, but I'm going to quit like next issue. Uh, <laughs> I may quit in like in two days and everyone's thought about it. It's like, let's vote for him so that we get a chance to join the X-Men. <laughs> Free slot in two days, yeah. two weeks. In two I weeks. Mean, that was kind of, I mean, I don't know this character as well. I've always, you know, it's, he's been like, I mean, my read has always been, he's kind of very proud, kind of pompous, almost mm-hmm. arrogant. Yeah. So it's like this, this page is him basically saying, I used to be very proud and arrogant and kind of a jerk. And now I'm not. And I'm like, all right. I guess that's you. You just worked out your problems, and then what? I guess you're just here now. Like it's it seemed like it kind of flat, almost like yeah. erasing a lot of like the personality of the character. You know exactly. It also to me just felt like it was missing one step. Like I kind of like this idea of somebody who's been looking for fulfillment. I think that's a good take on Sunfire. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. this idea of like he first he was selfish, then he joined the Avengers, then he fought for his country, and like all these versions of trying to be fulfilled. And that like he seeing the scope of what the X-Men are doing now made him think maybe I need to think about fulfillment in a different way. But it still just it doesn't quite work if you're reading it to go tonight watching but but tonight watching our world and Arakos transform, I stand before you wishing to only be of service it just didn't it didn't make sense well, to me. also no. i had problems with the layout of that page like i i know mm-hmm. they were trying to do a flame motif and because so many mm-hmm. of his the versions of him are a flame you can't really color the dividing things as a flame but then it just kind of looked like a coral reef and i was like what is, like <laughs> what does this have to do with sunfire it's not even like the motif of his costume it doesn't look like fire because you've knocked it back to such a light color and because of the reflections you put on it which wouldn't be on fire so like what even is this it just yeah, it felt like what like did you originally think it was going to be a data page or it just was really the whole thing was disorienting and- i read it several times and i i it didn't make sense and at the end of the day, it's just, it really is like a character being like, hey, I have these issues and character flaws, but I've figured them out. <laughs> and yeah. I'm, telling you, I'm telling you now, they happened all off panel, but I'm yeah. here now. I'm like, why do I care now? Like, that's not well, dramatic, I mean, you know? That's the thing, right? Like, he could he could have cared more because because he realized that there are more threats to the planet than any sure. that because of King in Black. That, because yeah. he was there. that, that would have been better. Because yeah. it's real, it's tangible, yeah. it's it's present. It's like, I because has Sunfire ever really been one of these space X Men? No, he he really no, never no. has been. Yeah. yeah. So he saw he saw what happened to Mars. He experienced what happened to King in Black, and therefore he feels like you know, with my powers, I have more to give, and 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 now I'm giving it to the X Men who is representing uh, Krakoa to the world and not just to one country. I think that makes more sense to me. Well, Jerry Duggan, all you have to do is buy several pallets full of Tyler's T-shirts to distribute. <laughs> uh, you can hand them out at cons from your table or whatever, but you can have that one uh, if you if you just chip in towards That's Tyler's fashion line. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. I think we've covered it. Yeah, I think we've got a yeah. very comprehensive view on this. So that's X Men number two. I look forward. I have optimism. I go I into every comic book trying yeah. to like it, and I think that there's enough positive things happening here that yeah. th- we still more good things could happen. But if you want to hear us yeah. figure out if more things good are going to happen, or if you want to know if we thought good things have been happening since the beginning of X of Swords, we've talked about every X Men issue every week since then. So all you have to do is look back on the channel. There's playlists. There's videos. We've really covered everything and the reason we get together to cover every x-men issue every single week tyler is why because x-men is better when read together that is right so on the behalf of tyler harry and myself we want to thank you for being together with us for x-men number two and until we get to be together with you again we hope very much here at crushing comics that you are well bye bye